Thank you for your talk. For me to open uh, today's uh, lecture of uh, Professor Eric Maskin, which is uh, the lecture on the introduction of the mechanism design. This is uh, the uh, traditional uh, Nobel Prize winner lecture, which is uh, uh, normally uh, organized within the uh, uh, Management and Game Theory Conference. And uh, I just uh, before starting this uh, very uh, important event uh, to us, I would like to say a few words about Professor Maskin and uh, properly about uh, the whole event. First of all, uh, let me uh, say uh, just a very interesting uh, fact that uh, uh, the number of uh, people who tried to register in, in two days was more than 200. So you are lucky people to be here. Second, uh, I would like to say uh, to introduce Professor Maskin. Uh, Professor Maskin is uh, the Adams University uh, professor at Harvard University. And he is the Nobel Prize winner uh, uh, in 2007 for, uh, uh, with uh, Horowitz and Meyerson for his uh, contribution to the uh, theory of mechanism design. Uh, actually, uh, well, uh, when I'm speaking about Professor Maskin, I want to say that he is a distinguished and outstanding scholar and professor. And if I will uh, 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 read the number of his uh, honorary professorships, visiting professorships, uh, honorary degrees, uh, how to how many uh, academies and professional societies, he is the member of the. Uh, member of uh, the uh, board uh, and uh, uh, that will take uh, a lot of time. I want to say that uh, uh, he is a very active scholar and uh, uh, it is especially worth mentioning that uh, he, is, he is carrying a very active uh, editorial work. And among the uh, journals which actually reflect his uh, achievements, his research interests are the the uh, journals, such journals as Review of Economic Studies, uh, Quarterly Journal of Economic, Journal of Risk and Uncertainty, Games and Economic Behavior, Economic Letters, my beloved journal, very short articles, but up to the point. Uh, Review of Economic Design, uh, Journal of Economic Perspectives, International Journal of Game Theory, Economics, Economic Theory, European Journal of Pure and Applied Mathematics. Uh, just, uh, I want to say that by his academic background and his education, uh, Professor Moskin is a mathematician, but he actually <laughs> chose what is uh, now in education called individual trajectory, from pure mathematics to applied mathematics and then to economics. And that seems to be a very productive uh, way to, uh, to research. And I hope that uh, in the future you will uh, concentrate more on management theory. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, probably we will get the second uh, Nobel Prize for that. <laughs> well, but uh, at this point I will stop and I would like to give this word to Professor Ulrich. Thank you. very much for, for coming here this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about a subject that I've spent much of my career on, uh, which is mechanism design. You may not know what that is, so uh, I will first try to give you a little definition. But uh, if you're like me, definitions don't really mean very much because they're too abstract. And so I will spend most of my time on a few examples. And I think that the examples will make it clear what the subject uh, is all about. I'll uh, 
I'll give you uh, two or three examples uh, to illustrate mechanism design theory. But first, uh, a small attempt at a, at a definition. I like to think of mechanism design as the, as the engineering part of, of economics. Many economists look at existing economic institutions and they try to explain or predict the outcomes that those institutions generate. Uh, and this is a very important part of economics. It's called the positive or predictive part of the field. It's about 90%, I would say, of what, uh, of what economists do. But I'm interested in the other 10% uh, when we, in effect, do just the opposite. We, we reverse the direction. We start with the outcomes. We say these are the outcomes we would like to achieve. These are the goals that we would like to achieve. And then we work backwards to ask whether we could design institutions or mechanisms or procedures which would give rise to the outcomes that we want. Uh, so this is the normative or prescriptive part of economics and it's only about 10% of the field, but it's the 10% that I like the best, and I, I, hope, uh, I hope you will like it too. Okay, so that's, that's my uh, attempt at giving a definition, uh, but as I say, this may, not, uh, this may not mean very much so far, so let's turn them right away to a little example. And an example that I I like to use, although it may not seem terribly important, is the problem of dividing a cake. Let's imagine that you are a parent, a mother, and you have a cake that you want to divide between your two children, Bob and Alice. Uh, and your goal is to divide the cake so that each child is happy with the piece that he or she has received. So that means that Bob should think that he has at least half the cake, and Alice should think that she has at least half the cake. And if you achieve this goal, we'll say that, that you've We'll reach a fair division. And I'm getting some feedback on uh, in the uh, sound. I wonder whether there's some way of stopping that. Is there, is there someone who can control the, uh, the sound? So, because I'm hearing myself com coming out of here, which is a little bit distracting. Should I, maybe I should stand over here. Um, Maybe I should stand over here. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is it's, it's coming with a delay. Uh, that's better. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but it, whatever it is, it's better. Uh, so we'll achieve um, a fair division if Al Alice thinks her piece is at least as big as Bob's and Bob thinks his piece is at least as big as Alice's. So the question is, how do we achieve this goal? Uh, if the mother knows that the children see the cake the same way she does, then there's a very simple solution. She takes a knife and she cuts the cake exactly in half and she gives each child one of the pieces, and because we're assuming that the children see the cake the same way that she does, then each child thinks that he's got half, or 
machine's got half. But the problem, you realize, is that children never see things the way their parents do. So the mother may think that she's divided the cake exactly equally, but it's very likely that Bob may think that Alice's piece is bigger. Uh, and if, if you have young children, you've probably experienced this problem yourself many times. Uh, so here's the difficulty. The mother wants to achieve a fair division, but she doesn't have enough information to do this on her own because she doesn't know how the children see the cake. And the mechanism design problem is whether it's possible to design a mechanism which results in a fair division, even though the mechanism designer herself, the mother, doesn't know what a fair division is. She doesn't have enough information to determine what a fair division is. Well, it turns out that, that what I've just described is actually a very old problem. It, it's literally thousands of years old. Uh, it appears in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Uh, there's a passage where Lot and Abraham are asking themselves how they can divide some grazing lands between them in a fair way. So it's the same thing as dividing a cake in a fair way. And just as the Bible states the problem, it also gives the solution. And it turns out that the solution is amazingly simple, but also very ingenious. And, and, and that's a quality that many mechanisms in mechanism design share, that, that they end up being remarkably simple, much simpler than you would have thought, but they require a lot of ingenuity to figure to, to discover them in the first place. But but here here's the solution from the Bible. One of the children, say Bob, should cut the cake. So Bob cuts the cake in two, and the other child, Alice, gets to take which piece she wants for herself. So this is called the divide and choose method. And here's why it works. It works because when Bob is cutting the cake, he has a strong incentive to cut it so that, from his point of view, the two pieces are exactly equal. Why? Because if one of the pieces is bigger, he knows Alice is going to take that one, and he'll be left with a smaller piece. And Alice wants as much cake as possible, and so does Bob. So Bob will try to cut the cake so that whichever piece Alice takes, he's happy with the other one. So Bob will be happy, and Alice will be happy because she gets to choose her favorite piece. And that solves the that solves the problem. So, uh, very very simple solution. And you may say, uh, why are we interested in such a simple problem? The reason why I I bring it up is that, despite being simple, it's already rich enough to illustrate some of the important features of mechanism design. First of all, as I've already said, the mechanism designer herself, the mother in this case, doesn't have enough information to know which outcomes are best uh, at the beginning. So she has to proceed indirectly through this mechanism. The mechanism in the cake example was the divide and choose procedure. That was the mechanism. And in effect, the participants, Bob and Alice, by 
playing this mechanism, by participating in this mechanism, generated the information necessary to identify a, uh, an optimal outcome. In this case, an optimal outcome means a fair division. But there, there's an important complication that this, that this cake example illustrates, which is that the participants don't necessarily share the, mechani the mechanism designer's goals. The mother wants to achieve a fair division. Bob and Alice don't care about a fair division. They just want as much cake as possible. So their, their goals are not the same as the mechanism designer's goals, and they have their own objectives, and when designing the mechanism, the mechanism designer has to take into account the participant's own goals. In other words, the mechanism has to be compatible with the participant's incentives. Okay, well that, that's my first example, um, and you may say, uh, who cares about cake? Uh, of course, Bob and Atlas care about cake, but uh, maybe you don't care about cake. But, so let me turn to, uh, to a, a harder problem, uh, and this is a, a problem that arose about 20 years ago, uh, at about that time, many, many countries around the world, many governments around the world, realized that it was inefficient for the government to own the right to transmit on uh, the radio spectrum. Uh, up till that time, in most countries, the, uh, all the broadcasting rights were owned by the governments. They might, uh, the, the government might uh, allow radio and television stations to use some of the, the uh, some of these radio frequencies. But by and large, most of these frequencies were not being used for any useful purpose, and that. That, uh, it was realized, was a big waste because in the 1990s, uh, we started to have lots of telecommunication companies who were very eager to get control of these radio frequencies for mobile phones and for um, satellite television and for all of the modern devices that we're so familiar with and that we're, that we're so reliant on now. Uh, so what many governments decided to do was to transfer the broadcasting rights from the public sector to the private sector. Uh, and that's the issue that I want to talk about in this, in this second example. Let's imagine that there's a government that wants to transfer the broadcasting rights for a particular band of radio frequencies to the private sector. We'll say that the, that the right to use those radio frequencies is a license. So they, they basically want to transfer ownership of this license from the government to uh, the private sector. Now let's, let's suppose that there are several telecom companies who are interested in this license, but there's only one license, so only one of them can get, can get it. Um, let's imagine that the goal of the government is to make sure that the company who values the license the most, who puts the highest value on the license, um, actually gets it. This is what economists would call an efficient outcome. Uh, when, when resources are allocated 
to the people or to the companies who value those resources the most, that is the efficient outcome from, uh, from an economic standpoint. So, so that's the goal of the government, to, to, uh, to achieve a, an efficient outcome. The problem is that the government doesn't know which company actually has the highest value for the license. So it doesn't know uh, whom to give it to. Once again, there's an information problem. Uh, so what can it do? Well, the simplest mechanism we could imagine it is for the government to ask each company how much do you value the license and then to give the license to the company that quotes the highest figure. But this, this mechanism is not likely to work very well. Why not? Because if a company understands that its chance of getting the license is higher, if it quotes a higher number, well then it'll just exaggerate its value. Uh, and if all of the companies are exaggerating, then there's no guarantee that the company that really does value the license the most will get it. So this, this mechanism is simple, but it's, it's too naive. It, 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 it's not going to work well. Uh, so let's consider a mechanism which is a little bit more sophisticated. What the government could do is to have each company make a bid for the license. A bid is a statement of how much you are willing to pay to receive the license. So, so each company is making a bid, and let's suppose that the company that makes the highest bid actually wins the license. Well, this mechanism, and, and, and then the winner pays its bid. The, winning, the, the company that gets the license uh, actually uh, pays the amount that it has bid. Um, that sounds like a better mechanism than the first one, and it is, uh, because now companies will not overbid. They will not exaggerate. If the company is worth, if, if the license is worth 10 million to me, I'm not going to bid 12 million because if I, if I win, then I have to pay 12 million, and that's too much. It's only worth 10 million. So companies won't exaggerate anymore, but the problem is that this mechanism still won't work because now companies have the incentive to understate, to bid less than their true value. If, 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 the, if the license is worth 10 million to me, I'm not going to bid 10 million because if I do bid 10 million and I win, I'll get something worth 10 million, but I have to pay 10 million, so my net benefit is zero. I might as well not have bothered to participate in the first place. I, I, might have, I should have just stayed home. So I will bid less than 10 million. Maybe I'll bid 8 million. Uh, by bidding 8 million, perhaps I reduce my chance of winning, but at least if I, if I win, I will have a net benefit, 10 million minus 8 million. Two, two million. So that means that, that all the bidders will be bidding less than their true values. All the companies will be underbidding. And once again, there's no guarantee that the company that is bidding the most is actually the company that has the highest value. So at this point, you might wonder, is there a mechanism, the, is there a mechanism which gets it exactly right, which stops companies from exaggerating, but also stops them from underbidding? Well, it turns out that the answer to the question is yes, there is a solution, 
Uh, and as you'll see, it's a very, very simple solution, once again, and a very clever solution. Uh, it's not nearly as old as the divide and choose method. It was discovered, it was discovered um, about 50 years ago, well, 55 years ago to be more exact, by the American economist William Vickrey. And for that reason, it's sometimes called the, the Vickrey mechanism. Um, and here's how it works. It's a bidding mechanism. So once again, every company makes a bid for the license. And once again, the winner is the high bidder, the company that bids the most. But now, instead of paying its own bid, the winner pays the second highest bid. So this is sometimes called the second bid or second price mechanism because winners don't pay their own bid, they pay the second highest bid. So for example, if there are three bidders and one bids 10 million and one bids 8 million and one bids 5 million, then the winner will be the 10 million bidder because that's the high bid, but it will pay only 8 million because that's the second highest bid. So I claim that this that this mechanism will actually solve the problem, that every company will bid exactly what the license is worth to that company. And so the high bidder will be the company that actually has the highest value. So why is this? Well, first notice that no company has the incentive to underbid, to understate, because it doesn't pay its bid anyway. If, if it's worth 10 million to me and I bid 9 million, and the second highest bid is 8 million, I pay 8 million whether I bid 9 million or 10 million. So the underbidding doesn't reduce my payment at all since it, it the payment is not what I bid anyway. So underbidding never is advantageous, and furthermore, it's dangerous. If, if, I, if I underbid, I, ri I run the risk of losing the license altogether. Suppose I, it's worth 10 million to me and I bid 7 million. Well, if some other company has bid 8 million, I will lose, and I will regret losing because if I had bid 10 million, I would have won, and I would have had a nice 2 million profit, 10 million minus 8 million. So underbidding is never a good idea. It never gets you any benefits, and it could be a very bad idea because it may end up losing you the license altogether. So you certainly don't want to underbid, but you also don't want to overbid. Say it's worth 10 million to you, but you bid 12 million, you overbid. Would that ever be a good idea? Well, no, because if the other companies are bidding less than 10 million, and you're then it doesn't matter whether you bid 10 million or 12 million, you're still bidding, you're, you're, you're still going to end up paying something less than 10 million because the, that's what the other companies are, are doing. So uh, overbidding doesn't change anything if the other companies are bidding less, if all the other companies are bidding less than 10 million. But imagine that one of the other companies is bidding 11 million, more, that is more than your value. Well, by bidding 12 million, you will win, it's true, because 12 million is more than 11, but you will regret, you will regret winning because you will have to pay 11 million, and that's too much. It's only worth 10 million to you. So by overbidding, you run the risk of overpaying. 
So you don't want to overbid either. And that means that the, the best strategy in this mechanism is to bid exactly what the license is worth to you. You don't underbid, you don't overbid. If it's worth 10 million to you, you bid 10 million. Uh, and that means that the company that actually has the highest value will win the license. And so we have once again solved the problem. And it, in a sense, it's remarkable that we've solved the problem because, remember, the government had no idea which company actually valued it the most. This mechanism identifies that company. Let me give you one more example. Uh, and you'll notice that each example is a little bit more complicated than the previous one. Uh, so th this, this example is, is a little bit more complicated, but not, not, it, it's not extremely complicated. So I, I, I think you'll be able to follow it. It's, um, it's going to be an example about energy. Uh, Let's imagine a, a society, it's a very small society, it, it just has two people. And we'll bring back our friends uh, Bob and Alice uh, to be the, the two people in the society. And, and Bob and Alice are interested in consuming energy. Uh, there are uh, different possibilities for energy. There, there, there's an energy authority in this society who has to decide what kind of energy Bob and Alice are going to use. There are four possibilities. Uh, there's gas, there's oil, there's nuclear power, and there's coal. And, and we'll imagine that the energy authority can only choose one of these because it's, it's too expensive to have more than one kind of energy in this very small society. Well, what the, what the authority would like to do is to choose uh, an energy source which Bob and Alice like. Uh, the problem is the energy authority doesn't know what Bob and Alice like. So, so it's the same kind of problem we've already been talking about. Let's imagine that there are two possibilities for what Alice and Bob like. In other words, two states of the world. Um, in one state, Bob and Alice uh, care mostly about consumption now, not so much about future consumption. In the other states, uh, they, uh, they care more about the future, not so much about current consumption. And the problem, the problem is that the authority doesn't know which of these two states is the actual state. Uh, to, be, to, to be more explicit, let's suppose that Alice cares mostly about how convenient energy is. So in, um, in state one, which is the case where she, she and Bob care mostly about current consumption, she, she likes gas the most because gas is the easiest to use, and then oil, and then coal, and then nuclear power comes at the bottom because nuclear power is very complicated to use. Uh, imagine driving cars that ran on nuclear power. Very, very complicated. Uh, but let's imagine that if Alice is looking into the future, if she cares mostly about future consumption, now nuclear power goes to the top of the list because Alice anticipates that there will be technological developments which make nuclear power much easier to use. Uh, now, let's, let's suppose that Bob, on the other hand, cares mostly about safety, how, how safe the energy is. Uh, so if, if he's putting most of the weight on the, on the present consumption, um, 
He likes nuclear power the most because he thinks that's the, the safest. He may not be right about that, by the way, but that's what he thinks. Uh, and then, then oil comes next and then coal and gas comes at the bottom because Bob is afraid of gas explosions. Um, but if, but if, if, if it turns out that Bob cares mostly about the future, in that case, nuclear power now goes to the bottom uh, because he's worried in the future about how to get rid of the nuclear waste uh, from nuclear power generation. So I've just described Alice and Bob's preferences in the two states and uh, we can summarize those preferences uh, in this table. So, so remember there are two possible states, state one and state two. In state one, Alice likes gas the most, then oil, then coal, and she puts nuclear power at the bottom, uh, and bo these are Bob's preferences. And in state two, I've, I've also summarized Alice and Bob's preferences, their, their rankings of the four alternatives. Now, the, as I said, the energy authority wants to do something that Bob and Alice like. Now, notice that Bob and Alice don't have the same preferences, and so the authority can't, um, can't make them both completely happy. The, the authority has to make some compromise between what Alice likes and what Bob likes. So what, what's a good compromise in state one? Well, well, oil is, is actually a good compromise in state one. Gas is not so good because although Alice likes gas a lot, Bob thinks gas is terrible. And nuclear power is not a good compromise because although Bob likes nuclear power, Alice doesn't like nuclear power at all. And coal is not a good compromise because both Alice and Bob prefer oil to coal. So that means that oil, oil is the right compromise in state one. And for very similar reasons, gas is the right compromise in state two. So the energy authority wants to choose oil in state one and gas in state two. But the problem is that the authority doesn't know what the state is. Alice and Bob know what the state is, but the energy authority doesn't know. So, so what, what, can, what can the authority do? Well, again, the simplest mechanism would be for the authority to ask Alice and Bob, what's the state? The problem is that it's not going to get a very clear answer, and, and here's why. Look, look at it from Alice's point of view. She knows that if the authority thinks that state one is the, is the true state, then it's going to choose oil. And if the authority thinks that state two is the true state, the authority is going to choose gas. But notice that Alice always prefers gas to oil. She prefers gas to oil in state one, she prefers gas to oil in state two, so she wants to make the authority think that state two is the true state, even if state one is the real state. So Alice will always say, state two, state two. But Bob has exactly the opposite incentive. Bob always prefers oil to gas. Bob prefers oil to gas in state one. Bob prefers oil to gas in state two. So he wants to make the authority believe that state one is the actual state. So Alice will say state two, Bob will say state one, and the poor 
energy authority will have no idea what the actual state is. So this, this simple mechanism will fail. And so we ha once again, we have to use something a little bit more um, ingenious. So, so what is the solution um, in this case? That's the solution. Now, now you might wonder what that is. Uh, some of you, uh, I know, have, uh, know about game theory. Uh, and this is, this is actually a game. It's a game played between Alice and Bob, where Alice chooses rows. She can either choose the top row or the bottom row, and Bob chooses columns. He can either choose the left column or the right column, and the outcome of the game is the intersection of Alice's and Bob's choices. So, for example, if Alice chooses the the bottom row, and Bob chooses the right column, then the outcome is gas, because that's the intersection of Alice and Bob's choices. So I claim that this game, this mechanism, will ensure that we get oil chosen in state one and gas chosen in state two. And, and let me show you why that's true. Let, um, so, so here, here's the argument for, for state one. Let, let's imagine that state one is the true state, and, and Alice and Bob know that, that. So Alice knows that these are her preferences, and Bob knows that these are his preferences. But the, of course, the mechanism designer, the, the energy authority, doesn't know this. Uh, and they're going to play this game here in, in state one. Now, um, what will Alice do? Well, if Alice thinks that Bob is going to choose the left column, then Alice will want to choose the top row. Why? Because if she chooses the top row, the outcome is oil. If she chooses the bottom row, the outcome is nuclear power. And notice that in state one, Alice prefers oil to nuclear power. So choosing the top row is the right choice for Alice if she expects Bob to choose the left column. But in fact, Bob will always want to choose the left column in state one, because if he, if he goes left and Alice chooses the top row, he gets oil rather than coal, but Bob prefers oil to coal. And if Alice chooses the bottom row, then going left is also best, because the, then he gets nuclear power rather than gas, and Bob prefers nuclear power to gas. So, so indeed, Bob will go left, that means that Alice will choose the top row. And to use the language of game theory, playing, Alice playing the top row, Bob playing the left column, is the Nash equilibrium of this game. So, uh, some of you uh, may have heard of John Nash, the uh, hero of the movie A Beautiful Mind. Uh, he developed a concept, which we now call Nash Equilibrium, for predicting how people are going to behave in si situations like that. And he predicted, and this turns out to be a very good prediction, uh, that uh, in, a, in a situation like this, Bob will choose the left column, Alice will choose the, uh, the upper row. And notice that when that happens, we get the right outcome, which is oil. Oil is exactly what we want in state one. So this mechanism solves the problem in state one. Well, I'm not going to go through the, the uh, 
the details, but you can verify that for very similar reasons, this mechanism also solves the problem in state two. What will happen is that in state two, Alice will choose the bottom row and Bob will choose the right column and the outcome will be gas, which is exactly what we want in state two. So we say that the, this mechanism um, this mechanism implements the energy authority's goals. The mechanism designer's goals. Okay, so, so I've shown you um, three examples, cake, telecom, and energy. And in each case, there was a solution. But I didn't tell you how we found that solution. So, I mean, it's nice that there is a solution, but you might wonder, how, how did we know that there is a solution and how could we find it? Um, so, uh, what, what I did, in effect, was a magic trick. I said, here's the problem, and here's the solution, uh, but there was, there was no uh, obvious connection uh, uh, between the solution and the, and the problem. You, did, you, you couldn't see how I got there. Uh, so, you might ask, is there a general way of determining whether a problem has a solution. Some, in the three examples, there was a solution in each case, but it's not always true that you can reach the goals that you want to achieve. So you want a way of determining, are these goals achievable or not? Maybe they're not achievable. If they are achievable, uh, we want to have a, an algorithm, a, a uh, a recipe we can follow for finding a mechanism that that solves the problem. So, so these these are the general questions that you can ask in mechanism design. Um, and it turns out that the answers to both these questions are yes. And it, don't, don't worry, I'm not going to show you why the answers are yes tonight, uh, but if you're interested uh, you, and you want to do some further reading, uh, you can read this uh, paper of mine. It's almost 40 years old now, um, where I show why the answer to both questions is yes. Um, what I would like to finish with is a look into the future. Uh, mechanism design, the, 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 uh, the formal theory of mechanism design has now been around for over half a century. Uh, it goes back to the Vickery mechanism that I was telling you about before, so early 1960s. But there's a sense in which the most important problems for mechanism design to solve are still in the future. Uh, at one reason, I think, why mechanism design continues to be important even 55 years later is that there are always new problems coming up uh, which it can be used to help solve. And, and let, me, let me mention um, two of those problems. Um, one is, is climate change. Uh, we're all aware of the problem of climate change. It's, it, it's caused because we're emitting greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and, and these gases are trapping heat and making the whole earth get warmer. Uh, and the, the problem with this is that in the long run there can be 
catastrophic events, such as the polar ice caps melting and causing the sea levels to rise uh, 20, uh, you know, 7 meters or 8 meters, which would be devastating. Uh, now, how do we solve the problem? Well, the, 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 uh, the obvious thing to do is to stop emitting all this carbon dioxide. But this gets back to uh, the same sorts of issues that arose in the cake problem. Uh, the goal in the cake problem was to have a fair division, but Bob and Alice didn't care about fair division. They wanted more cake. And, and the same problem arises with, with climate change. Uh, each country in the world is interested in its own uh, economic welfare. It's, it would be very happy if the other countries reduced their carbon emissions. That would be great. But it doesn't want to reduce its carbon emissions because that's very expensive. It means adopting new technology uh, or shutting down outmoded factories or putting limits on, on uh, the sorts of cars people can drive. No one likes to do that. Uh, so that, that's, why, that's why solving climate change is such a big problem, because no country wants to do it on its own. The, the, uh, the way to solve the problem, of course, is with an international treaty, uh, where the treaty is designed so that each country is willing to participate in exchange for the participation of the other country. So I'm willing to sign because you're willing to sign and vice versa. Now we don't have such a treaty yet, but you can see, I think, that, that to achieve a successful treaty is an exercise in mechanism design. Writing a treaty that countries are willing to sign is it itself a mechanism design problem. And we don't have that solution yet, but I'm confident that we will have it uh, in time. And when we, do, when we do solve the problem, mechanism design, the, the same kinds of principles that I was talking about tonight, will be at the at the heart of that solution. Let me, let me mention one other important application for the future, and that's uh, preventing financial crises. We're, we're still recovering from the worst financial crisis since the 1930s. This crisis happened uh, about eight years ago, uh, and it was so serious that we're still paying the consequences. So it, it, it's important that we try to stop this from happening again. Now, how, how did it happen in the first place? It happens, well, it, 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 was, it was similar to climate change, just as uh, without regulation, without a treaty, every, com every, every country of the world uh, produces too, too much carbon dioxide. In, in finance, it, without regulation, every bank is going to take too much risk. Uh, and, and that's okay as far as the individual bank is concerned because it's in the, it's in the business of taking risks. That's what banks are supposed to do. But the problem in financial markets is that the, a, a risk doesn't end with the bank that has taken that risk. If, if that bank fails, typically other banks are involved too because they've perhaps invested in the same kinds of projects that the, that the bank that's failing has, has invested in. So, if the original bank fails, they fail too. In other words, we get a chain reaction of failures, and that's exactly what happened eight years ago, and that's exactly 
the problem of financial crises, chain reactions. So we need, just as we need an international treaty to stop too much carbon dioxide emission, we need financial regulation to stop chain reactions of bank failures. We don't have such a regulatory process yet, although I would say that things are better now than they were eight years ago. We've moved a few steps in that direction, but we, no we need to go farther. And once again, when we do go farther, it will be because of mechanism design. And that really concludes what I was hoping to tell you about this evening. Um, and I'd like to thank you for listening so patiently. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Moskin. And now we have uh, time for questions. If there are any questions, please. And please represent yourself. Professor Maskin, thank you very much for your interesting uh, lecture. Uh, my name is Georgi Alexandrov, St. Petersburg State University. Uh, my question is about uh, future applications of the mechanism design theory. And uh, in all of your uh, examples, there were some mechanism designer, some authority who can punish the uh, players. Or uh, these players are symmetric, so they are relatively the same. But the future applications, these potential applications, in these situations, we have uh, usually different uh, and non-symmetric uh, players, such as uh, different countries. And they are absolutely different in, yeah, in terms of the economy and so on. Uh, or we have no um, mechanism designer who, have, uh, who has a power to punish them or to if uh, some of the uh, players br uh, break the rules of the game and on the mechanism. So how can we deal with that? Okay, thank you. Uh, that's a very good question. And, and, and there's an important difference between um, future application one and future application two, which you've already pointed to, which is that in the case of a, uh, of a single country, like Russia or the United States, the governments can play the role of the mechanism designer and regulate banks, for example, and if the banks don't follow the regulations, they can be punished. Uh, but what do we do in the international sphere when there, we, don't have a, we don't have a global government? Who is going to punish a country that violates the international treaty? Uh, so there's a sense in which application two, the international treaty problem, is harder than the second problem because there is because there's no in, enforcing authority. Uh, instead, what we have to do when designing a treaty is to make it uh, self-enforcing. By self-enforcing, I mean that countries are willing to sign the treaty and to stick to the terms of the treaty. Uh, because they know that if they don't, something uh, bad is going to happen to them. Now, in the case of climate change, uh, a, a climate change treaty, uh, that something might be uh, economic sanctions that other countries take against the, uh, the, the, the country that is doing the violating. Um, it, or it could take the, 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 the form of um, re 
restricting travel, or it could take the form of, uh, in extreme cases, it could even take the form of, uh, of, of military action. Uh, but one feature of an international treaty is that it has to be good for all the, the signatories. It, no one can be forced into signing. They, it, it has to be worth every country's while. The, in the case of climate change, the risk of a climate catastrophe is the reason why we're trying to to write such a treaty in the first place. One uh, reason in addition to the to the sanctions why countries might choose to adhere to the to the treaty is that if they don't then the treaty runs the risk of falling apart and one of these climate catastrophes could occur. So um, that, I should say, back in the days of the Soviet Union, the, the, the U.S. And the, and the Soviet Union had various international agreements about nuclear weapons. And those were also self-enforcing. And, and, and the, the, the reason why they were successful is both sides were afraid to violate the treaty because if they did violate the treaty, the treaty might fall apart and then they would be in this e extremely dangerous nuclear arms race, which they both wanted to avoid. So, so just as the, the, the nuclear agreements were self-enforcing, it should be possible to design a climate uh, agreement that is self-enforcing, uh, but you're quite right that it's harder to do that than than uh, than the second application, or for that matter, the three applications that I was talking about uh, in my uh, uh, in, in my lecture. Um, we haven't solved problem one yet, but. Um, I'm optimistic that we will, despite the additional problems. Hello, my name is Sergei Telmachev. I'm an MBA student from here. So my problem is, can you make some comments on how to make their uh, proper outcome decision. So in all these theories you told us, you knew for sure that outcome is the truth. But in case of carbon dioxide, for example, no one really can prove that that will save, uh, solve the problem. Uh, so basically, can you make some comments of designing not mechanism but choosing of outcome. I'm I'm not entirely sure I'm following the question. Uh, uh, well, for example, in the case of cutting the cakes, the result is obvious, and you have to choose the you can choose the obvious you can achieve this goal. But in case of carbon dioxide. No one really sure, like majority might be sure, but no one really sure that uh, decrease in the carbon dioxide will lead. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah. Well, some uncertainty we have to live with. Uh, we, it's it's impossible to predict exactly what will happen if we stop emitting so much carbon dioxide, or if we continue emitting so much carbon dioxide, all of our predictions have 
a great deal of uncertainty mixed, in, mixed into them. And so really an outcome is a, is a probability distribution. That, that's the best we can do to, to say that there's a certain probability of this happening, a certain probability of that happening. Uh, so in, in application one, you should think of the outcomes not as complete certainties, but rather probability dist distributions. But if you do that, then formally speaking, the same theory applies. It's just applied to... Uh, to a different kind of object. Thank you. And any more questions? If not, then may I ask you a question? Oh. Uh, Marat Smirnov, Graduate School of Management, St. Petersburg University. Uh, first of all, Professor Maskin, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. My question is about the prerequisite of the theory of, the theory of mechanism, design of mechanism. Am I right that the key idea, key prerequisite, is that the engineer or the authority uh, wants to achieve the optimal or, in other words, this engineer or the authority has the same attitude for the agents in the economy. Because we do know that, for example, from the viewpoints of financial crisis, the authorities very often think that these banks are too big to fail. In very big amount of countries, there is a kind of crony capitalism when the authority has the privileges for the particular agents in the market, speaking for, for example about the telecommunication markets or any other companies that try to capture some resources from the government. So the question is, has now the theory of uh, this theory some, again, mechanisms to input these specific characteristics of the real world into the design itself, or how we could measure this quality of the engineer when he or she tries to implement the specific mechanism in the country. Thank you. Right, a, a, a very good question. So, so uh, if, I, if I'm interpreting you right, you're saying uh, the, that I've been implicitly assuming that the mechanism designer is some benevolent being uh, that wants to do the right thing for society. But of course, uh, mechanism designers or governments are human like everyone else and they, they actually have their own goals. And how do we get uh, people in governments to do what they're supposed to do? Uh, and, and, and that's, and that's uh, a mechanism design problem too. And I would, I would say that uh, there are uh, there are several mechanisms which can be used to uh, to get governments to behave well. One um, is elections. Uh, if if uh, you you can think of the political process itself, the electoral process itself, as a mechanism where if our government officials don't do what, they're, what they said they were going to do or what we want them to do, we replace them. We, we, we throw them out of office and, and we replace them with, uh, uh, with other officials. So that, that, that's an example of a, of a mechanism. Um, another thing we can do uh, is to uh, uh, is to punish officials who have been found to uh, to violate the law. Um, one one country that was able to dramatically reduce its corruption rates was. Um, was Singapore. Singapore used to be extremely corrupt. Uh, now it's not. And, and uh, 
they, they used quite an ingenious mechanism to, uh, to reduce corruption. What they, what they did was to raise government salaries. Um, now, you might think that's a strange thing to do, but uh, raising government salaries had two good effects. First, it made taking bribes, uh, government officials taking bribes, less attractive because if you're already being paid well, you don't need to take illegal money in order to have a good life. You already have it. But furthermore, um, if, if you behave corruptly, you ran the risk of losing this nice, well-paid job and, uh, and, and going to jail. So, uh, Singapore, I think, Singapore had a, had a, had a very clever solution to the, uh, to the corruption problem. Now, I, I, those are just two examples, but I think you get the idea that uh, getting governments to behave well is also a mechanism design problem which, that can potentially be solved. Okay. More questions? Now, may I ask one question? Just uh, regarding the, uh, the, uh, the telecommunication examples. Well, uh, I think the uh, solution itself heavily relies on uh, the difference between the uh, best bid and second highest bid. And uh, uh, if, if it's not meaningful, then there will be a problem just because there will be only one solution. So there will be no profit for the highest bid. So if in this uh, uh, mechanism uh, design, if it is envisaged certain, let's say, discretion step for, for the bids, which, is, which could be a normal way to solve the problem. So, so you're saying that, um, say there were two companies that both yeah. bid 10 million? Uh, no, no, well, for instance, uh, both one uh, bids uh, 10 million, uh, another bids 9.9 uh, uh, .9 million. Yeah. Well, then, then the company that bid 10 million would win and it would pay 9.9. .9. So it doesn't make sense. It, it, well, it, it, it still makes profit, not, but just not a very big one. Uh, the, 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 the point is that if we use this mechanism, uh, all company, a, a winning company will never lose money, and it, and it, and it, might, it might win money, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's never going to want to, uh, to stay home, because it always has a chance of, of, of getting something. So uh, that, that's the sense okay. in which it, it solved, the, the mechanism solves the problem. No, no, the mechanism, of course. No. So thank you. If there are no questions, uh, uh, then uh, let me thank you, Professor Martin, for a very inspiring uh, lecture. Mm -hmm. and very